Here we are beginning the concluding book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Uh, one of the five books written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by the Apostle John. And he was pretty close to 90 years old, we believe, when he was given this wonderful revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see that there are some things very difficult to understand perhaps here in the book of Revelation, but there are also plenty of things that we can understand, things that we can respond to. Uh, we know when people think of the book of Revelation, they often think in terms of end time events, and rightly so. We read about the great tribulation, the antichrist, the rapture, uh, the second coming, the final judgment, the new heavens and the new earth. However, we must realize that Jesus Christ is the central character and the central theme of the book of Revelation. I will see that as we begin reading in Revelation 1. It begins with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to identify that word revelation to define it. It's the Greek word from which we get our English word apocalypse. It's a word that literally means an unveiling, something that is uncovered or unveiled. It's not the revelation of the Apostle John. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's the revelation, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So plan on seeing Jesus as the main character here in the book of Revelation. And if I fail to point you to Jesus in our study of Revelation, I have certainly failed in my duty. We know that lifting up Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I believe we should ask for his help as we begin our study today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the book of Revelation, a book, Lord God, that you've promised us contains a blessing for us as we read, as we study, as we hear. Uh, we pray that the Spirit of God, the one who inspired the scriptures, would give us understanding and help. Uh, things, Lord God, that may be difficult to understand, that you would give us insight and understanding. You would enlighten our eyes and our hearts to receive. You'd help us to obey those things, Lord God, that are commands to be obeyed. Lord, you'd help us to be both challenged and comforted by the word of God. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to begin reading there. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So we see first that the Father gave this revelation to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who in turn gave it to his servants, including the Apostle John. Uh, this came to John by way of angelic messenger and by way of the Lord himself. Angels are prominent in the book of Revelation. We'll see a lot of angels. At times it may be difficult to keep track of all of them. However, remember it's about Jesus. The angels are secondary. Now if you're his servant, and I hope that you are, remember he's giving this to you also. It says here that this will speak of things which must shortly come to pass. Now you might already be asking, how is that possible when nearly 2,000 years have transpired since these words were given to us? A couple of things to think about today. One, God's timetable is not like ours. Uh, the Apostle Peter told us that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. We also recognize that the Greek word translated shortly here can be translated in English as quickly. When these events begin to take place, they'll begin to happen quickly. Get ready. When God begins to move in the prophetic realm, it will start happening suddenly in an hour for at least the unsaved when they think not. We realize that this revelation is a Revelation given with a special blessing attached. There are blessings associated, of course, with the entirety of the Word of God. Every chapter, every verse, every line inspired by the Holy Spirit given to us for our edification and comfort. 
However, Revelation is the only book with a special blessing and a special curse associated with it. Here in verse 3, we find the special blessing. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. God has a special blessing for you if you read this book. Uh, if you continue on with us as we are beginning this study of Revelation, you will have read through the entirety, all 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. He also says there's a special blessing for you if you hear this book read. And with the Lord's help, I'll be reading each verse and each portion of Scripture as we go along, and you'll have heard the book of Revelation read. There's a blessing for that. And then he says, And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So not only to read, but to hear, and then to obey those things that are written here in the book of Revelation. And as we've said, there'll be some things difficult perhaps to understand at first, but there'll be plenty of things that we'll realize, here's a command I need to obey. Here's something that's given to me, and I know what to do about it. So when we come here to the beginning of this Bible study series, we're expecting something. We're expecting to see Jesus, and we're expecting to receive a blessing. A blessing that comes from the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God revealed to us in three persons or three personalities. He says in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Let me pause there just a moment. And have you consider that number seven. Seven in scripture often speaks of something that is perfect or complete. And we will see the number seven, multiples of seven, numerous, numerous times in the book of Revelation. Uh, there'll be seven churches, seven angels, uh, seven trumpets, seven seals, many, many sevens here in the book of Revelation. Here in a little bit, we'll see the seven spirits. So consider that word seven. And we realize that it's written to seven literal churches, which were in Asia, Asia Minor, uh, modern day Turkey. So speaking originally to these seven churches, he says, grace be to you and peace. Now, who is this grace and peace coming from? Well, he says it's coming from the father. From him which is and which was and which is to come. Uh, this takes us all the way back, I believe, to Exodus 3, where the Lord is revealed to us as the great I am, the eternally self-existent one. Not the I was, not the I will be, but the I am, the one who was and is and is to come, the eternal God. These blessings of grace and peace also come from the Holy Spirit. He says, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Uh, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And don't get the idea, you know, don't try to create some strange heretical doctrine that there are seven Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit, but he is perfect, complete. Uh, that's the significance of the word seven here. We might say the sevenfold spirit. And these blessings also come to us by way of the, the Son of God. And from Jesus Christ, verse 5 says, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen which means let it be so. So special emphasis is made here about God the Son. He's described here in some very, very telling terms. He's the faithful witness. He faithfully did what he was sent to do in coming to the earth and dying for the sins of mankind. 
He is the first begotten from the dead, the first to know the blessing of rising in a resurrection body, a glorified body. He's the first fruits, the first begotten of the resurrection. And he is uh, the promise that we will know that blessing ourselves one day. Uh, you may have come to the realization that this earthly body you're living in is beginning to wear down. But you know that one day you'll have a brand new body. And that promise comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first begotten from the dead. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. This is a theme we'll see repeatedly in Revelation, that he is king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, the kingdoms of this world will become one day the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Uh, this wonderful Savior is the one who saved us, washing us in his own blood. Some today try to downplay the blood of Jesus. Beware of anyone who does that. We'll see that the importance of the blood of Christ is something seen, uh, sometimes prophetically, sometimes in types and symbols, but it's seen from Genesis to Revelation. A little bit later in Revelation, we'll see Jesus depicted as a lamb that had been slain. Even in eternity, we'll be rejoicing in the fact that he died, that he shed his blood to redeem us. He is the one who made us kings and priests. The idea of ruling and reigning with Jesus is also an important theme that we'll see in Revelation. And it's to that one, that great king, that we offer today glory and dominion forever. He is that one child of God that will soon come in clouds of glory. Verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. This lets us know it's not speaking of the rapture, uh, but when he comes in glory at the end of the tribulation period, when he comes with his saints. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. It's going to be a time of great judgment. Even so, amen. Now clouds in scripture are symbolic of the glory of God and a study of clouds and especially the glory cloud is an amazing study in the word. We remember the glory cloud, the Shekinah glory came down on the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. There were times when the priests could not stand to minister because of the glory of God. God led them, you will remember, by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, the glory of God. In the New Testament, we remember that when Mary was told by the angel Gabriel that she was going to bring forth Jesus, he told her it would be a miracle of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God would literally overshadow her, which means to cover as with a cloud. The glory of God would come upon her. And it would be a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Later on, when Jesus was transfigured, we speak of the transfiguration when Jesus, along with three of the apostles, was on top of the mountain that uh, his heavenly glory began to shine through. The cloud of God's glory appeared there on the mountain. Acts 1 tells us that when Jesus ascended back to heaven, a cloud received him out of their sight. Was it just a natural cumulus cloud floating there in the blue sky? Perhaps. Somehow I believe it was a cloud of God's glory. And here we're told that when he returns, he'll return with clouds. I believe that's clouds of glory. Every eye will behold him. And this is what indicates to us that this is the coming of Christ in power and glory at the end of the tribulation, that this is not the rapture. The rapture, he'll come and, and catch away his church. He'll come for his church. At the second coming, he'll come with his church. Every eye will see him on that day. Now, how is that possible? Of course, God can make it possible in a miraculous way. Some have suggested that due to modern technology, it will be possible through television, satellite technology, and the Internet. People will watch it on their phones. Who knows? And he says, those who pierced him will weep and wail. This is the Jews recognizing finally 
at the time of his return that he was their Messiah, that they had rejected him, and they'll turn to Christ. Now this is spoken of prophetically in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. Zechariah has so many things dealing with the last day's events. Zechariah 12.10 says, I will pour out upon the house of David, that's the Jews, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me, that's the Lord, whom they have pierced, that's the, the crucifixion and the suffering of Christ. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And as I said, I believe this will take place at the end of the period known as the Great Tribulation, uh, there at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. Even so, amen. Even so, let it be. This is the equivalent of saying, even so, come, Lord Jesus. One of the things we see clearly here, too, is the deity, the, the Godhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal. That's the significance of Alpha and Omega. These are the beginning and ending letter of the Greek alphabet. Uh, this is the equivalent of saying Jesus is everything from A to Z. He's the beginning and the end. Now this is also an Old Testament reference. It takes us back to Isaiah 41.4. The question is asked, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? Who knew everything from the beginning of time? Of course, it was the Lord. And he goes on, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Now, if you read this in your Bibles, you'll notice in most translations, I read from the King James Version, and it was so in, in my Bible, but the word Lord will be in all capital letters. Uh, when you see that in the Old Testament scriptures, Lord with all capital letters, sometimes theologians will call that the tetragrammaton. That's just a, a big word that lets us know that in the original, this is Yahweh, the Lord, Jehovah. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is attributing this verse to himself. And he's telling them that I am Yahweh that your fathers knew in the Old Testament. And he says he was and is and is to come. And this is a reference that was earlier spoken of referring to the Father and now spoken of referring to the Son. And he's the Almighty. Jesus Christ is more than a man, more than a prophet. He is the Son of God. God come down in human flesh. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He is omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty. Glory to his name today. Now, we realize that John was in the Spirit when he received this revelation. In verse 9, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. We've already seen who that is. That's Jesus. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. John speaks of himself as a brother and companion in tribulation of those in these seven churches. And like many of them, he's suffering persecution at the hands of an ungodly world. Uh, in fact, he is at that very present time on the prison island of Alcatraz, a mining island where prisoners were sent to work in the mines. Uh, when he was sent there, it's estimated he was somewhere around 90 years of age. Now, can you imagine them feeling so threatened by a 90-year-old man that they incarcerated him? What was his crime? Well, his crime was the word of God, preaching this word, testifying about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that would truly be persecution for righteousness sake. The kind of persecution that Jesus says, if we 
receive it, we're to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Well, it says he was caught up in ecstasy. He was in the Spirit, worshiping God on the Lord's day. Now, this could be one of two things, and I'll share both of them with you. Sunday is the Lord's day, the day uh, that the church, for the most part, celebrates the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, every Sunday is not Easter Sunday, so to speak, but every Sunday, every Lord's Day, we remember that Jesus rose from the dead early in the morning on the first day of the week. So some believe that John, even though he was perhaps alone on that island, he was a prisoner, realized it was the Lord's Day and he was acknowledging the resurrection. And on that day, caught up in the Spirit, uh, he received this revelation. It could also be translated, though, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. And all through the Bible, we see the day of the Lord uh, speaking of the end time events. Uh, you know, the great tribulation, the coming judgment. And uh, that is also possible uh, because we do know that John in the spirit saw things that were to take place on the day of the Lord doesn't really matter because uh, the revelation is the same regardless. The Lord Jesus, identified because he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, spoke to him with a voice like a trumpet. Now this is nothing new. We see trumpets speaking several times in the Word of God or trumpet-like voices. The rapture will occur with the sounding of a trumpet. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, where God's word says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Remember, a mystery is not something that is presently hidden. It's something that was hidden or something that was once only known through types and symbols and prophetic words, but has now been revealed in Christ. So he says, Behold, I show you a mystery, something that is now being revealed. We shall not all sleep, and that's the sleep of death. Uh, the Bible does not teach soul sleep, as some of the cults do. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. But it does teach that our bodies will sleep, that they'll lie in the grave until the day of resurrection. It says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. One generation will not know physical death, but they'll also receive this change to a glorified body. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, faster than you can blink your eye, there, there won't be time to repent. That's why you've got to be ready now. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, that is, with a glorified body, and we shall be changed. Our bodies will be changed into glorified bodies too. And all of that in the twinkling of an eye, and all of that announced by the sounding of a trumpet. We see this also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and there's only one in scripture uh, given that designation, and that's Michael, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, their bodies that have been in the grave since they died, their, their bodies that have been sleeping will be raised changed and they'll, they'll meet their spirits their souls that have been with the Lord since the time of their death then we which are alive and remain and notice that Paul believed that he would probably be alive at the rapture the coming of the Lord for his church we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds so uh, the dead in Christ will rise first their bodies will be changed and reunited with their spirits and we'll be caught up together with them. Our bodies will be changed. All of this in the twinkling of an eye. He says, we'll meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And once again, this is accompanied with the trumpet of God. A little bit later on in Revelation, when John himself is caught up to heaven, it will once again be done with the sounding of a trumpet. Look with me to Revelation 4.1. John says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. 
which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Praise God. Uh, one day I believe that the redeemed will hear that call, that trumpet sound that is speaking to them, come up hither. This is a type, a, a picture, a prefiguring of the rapture. And also note here in this section that for the second time we hear mention of the recipients of this letter. Seven churches, except here that they're named, and all of these were actual literal churches in what is called in Scripture Asia or Asia Minor. Today we know this area as Turkey. And it was a strong area of Christian influence at that time. Uh, there were churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And sadly that area is predominantly Islamic now. And so our prayer should be that God would uh, bring the gospel once again to that part of the world. So here he is, caught up in the Spirit, and he sees a heavenly vision. A heavenly vision. We will see now a description of how John saw Jesus in his heavenly glory. Now, I personally do not believe he saw him in his complete glory. Uh, 1 John 3 tells us that one day we will, but we'll have to have a glorified body for that. This this body, these senses as we have them today could not tolerate the full glory of God. Your eyes could not take it. Your ears could not take it. But one day we will see him in his full glory. But John did see him, and not just as he was walking here on earth, but with a great deal of his heavenly glory revealed. And this is the second time that he's experienced something like this. Remember we talked about the transfiguration. Where John, along with Peter and James, saw Jesus clothed with glory, transfigured there on the mountain. We're going to see some symbols here. And you know, where it's a dangerous thing. There are those that try to symbolize just about everything in the Bible. And they try to make everything symbolic and try to explain away things and take away from the clear, literal meaning of Scripture. That is a great danger. We need to take the Bible at face value. But we do also need to realize that there are symbols, definitely, in the Word of God. But for the most part, we can find those symbols defined for us elsewhere in the Word of God. So let's look at some of those symbols. Revelation 1.12 And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. That was that trumpet-like voice that he heard. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, the Lord showed him these candlesticks, but these candlesticks were symbolic. They represented something, and we'll see that. Now, don't think wax candles. Think of oil lamps. Think of like the menorah there in the, in the temple of God. Uh, oil lamps that were fed by olive oil, you know, a picture of the Holy Spirit. This speaks of our testimony. Remember, Jesus said that we're the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. This is remembering that Jesus is the light of the world, and we're called to reflect that light to a lost and dying world living in darkness. So later on in this chapter, we'll see the definition of what these candlesticks and some of these other symbols are. It's really important for us to note, and we'll find out why later, that Jesus was walking in the midst of those candlesticks. What's he doing? We'll find out. Jesus is described here as the Son of Man. This does not speak of his humanity, but his deity. You know, we hear Son of Man, we immediately think his humanity, but this takes us all the way back to the book of Daniel. And uh, verse 13 of Revelation says, In the midst of the seven candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man. That's Jesus clothed with a garment down to the foot, a long robe, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, a belt around him made of gold. Now the garment down to the foot and the golden girdle speak of the garb of a high priest. Jesus is our great high priest, the one who 
shed his blood, the one who gives us access to the Father. But this idea of the Son of Man takes us back to Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel and Revelation tie in together so many ways. Daniel 7, 13, Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, apparently a dream. Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. There's the clouds again, the glory cloud. And came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Praise God. So we, we see that he is that amazing one that is spoken of there in the book of Daniel. Well, let's read on here. It says in verse 14 that his head and his hairs were white like wool. What's the significance of that? I believe we'll see here in just a moment as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So his voice was compared to a trumpet earlier, and here to like a Niagara Falls of water. And he had in his right hand seven stars, another symbol. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, still another symbol, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Uh, that's why we'll need a glorified body. You could no more stand before him without a glorified body than you could stand before the sun. So let's look at these things. His head and hairs, white like wool, as white as snow. Now, that speaks of his eternity. That is, again, a reference to Daniel's prophecy. Uh, I don't really like to see people try to depict the Almighty uh, in pictures and, and things like that. But when they do, they often show him with a white beard and white hair. And, you know, that's not to say he's an old man. He's eternal. But I, I believe that the artist did that to sort of depict that he's the ancient of days. He's forever. He's eternal. And once again, we go to Daniel and, and get some insight on this. In Daniel 7, 9, he speaks of God as the Ancient of Days. I love that expression, the Ancient of Days, the one that has always been. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did set, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands, that's millions, ministered unto him. And ten thousand times... 10,000 stood before him, and we see uh, the great number of angels also depicted in the book of Revelation. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So Jesus Christ is depicted here as the Ancient of Days, the Eternal One, uh, the one that was depicted back in Daniel, and his hearers would have been familiar with the Old Testament Scripture, and I think they would have immediately gone back in their minds to this Daniel prophecy says the judgment. You remember, Daniel, we just read the judgment was set. The books were open. We're all going to stand before God one day. And it says his eyes are like a flame of fire. That speaks of fiery judgment. His eyes do not miss anything. They see into the secret recesses of the human heart. Uh, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, spoke of, of a judgment where our works would be tried so as by fire. See what they were made of. His fiery gaze, nothing is invisible to him. He knows the heart. Also speaking along those lines, it says his feet are like polished brass. Remember we said these symbols could be defined elsewhere. Brass is a symbol of judgment in Scripture. So if his feet are brass, that means he's moving toward judgment. And his voice... Not only like a trumpet, but like the roaring of mighty waters. Praise God. Well, let's look at some of these symbols in a little more depth. And he hath in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. 
and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Praise God. So where is Jesus standing? Well, he was standing in the midst of these seven candlesticks. What was he holding? Well, he was holding seven stars in his right hand. More sevens. Remember, I told you that number seven would be important. Seeing all of this, it was so overwhelming that John fell at his feet like a dead man, overcome by the glory and presence of God, experiencing perhaps what some might call being slain in the spirit, so to speak. He is the one, Jesus, that has the keys of death and hell. Keys are authority. I love what one brother said. He said, Jesus has the keys to hell, and he never lets the devil borrow them. Praise God. Praise God forever. I'm glad that he does still have the keys of death and hell. And one day he's going to put our arch enemy, Satan, he's going to send forth an angel and he's going to cast him into hell. Well, this next verse gives us an outline. The outline of the book of Revelation is found in Revelation 1.19. And it's very interesting that he gives us this outline. It tells us exactly what is covered in the book of Revelation, he says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So the first part of the book of Revelation, the first part of this outline, is Revelation 1, the things which you have seen. That would mean the, the vision of Jesus and his power and glory, the things that we're talking about right now. Beginning the next time we're together, this will be the part of Revelation, the things which are, the, the literal seven churches. So in Revelation 2 and 3, we'll find the things that are, the letters given to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And then in Revelation 4 through the end of the book, chapter 22, we'll find the things which shall be hereafter, the future tense part of Revelation, and that is by far the longest part of this outline. Uh, so next week, if Jesus tarries in his coming, we will be beginning the second part of Revelation, the things that are, the, the letters to the seven churches. So as I said, these symbols will be defined for us. Revelation 1.20, the mystery of the seven stars. Remember, a mystery is something that's been revealed. He's going to reveal this to us. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, remember those seven candlesticks which we saw earlier? And I said it has to do with testimony, being a light. These are seven churches. And remember, Jesus is walking in the midst of them, and in the next couple of chapters, he's going to be speaking to them regarding their testimony. Some of them are really shining the light, and some of them are not. And I also mentioned to you that it's important to realize that Jesus is walking in the midst of the candlesticks. Jesus knows exactly what's going on in his church. He knows what's going on in Madariville Assembly of God. If you're a part of another church body. He knows what's going on in your local church. He knows the testimony, whether it's good or bad, whether the light is shining from those candlesticks or whether it's not. And then he speaks of the stars in his right hand. He says, these are the angels, angelos in Greek, the angels of those churches. Now, that is the word that is often translated as angel. It means messenger. And it's possible that angels may oversee the ministry of churches. We believe that there are angels given us guardians of human beings. We talk about quote unquote guardian angels. It's very possible that each church has an angel or angels that are assigned to protect and defend and oversee what's happening there. We're going to see in a little while that when Jesus gave letters, special messages to each of the churches, that they were given to the angels of the churches. So some believe that since angel means messengers, these could have been the, the pastors, the leadership of the local churches. 
Whatever the case, it's a real blessing to me to realize that these stars are in his right hand. Jesus is holding the ministry of his churches and perhaps even the ministers of his churches in his hand. As a pastor of a local church, I find that very comforting and, and quite a blessing. And then, of course, we see the sword in his mouth, once again a symbol. And we know from elsewhere that that is nothing less than the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Praise God. That is the one that one day we will see. We will see him as he is, and we will be like him. Praise God. Praise God. I believe that the fitting response for those of us who are believers for this first chapter of Revelation would be to praise him and thank him for what he's promised us here. Let's do that. Father, we thank you for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've revealed to him who he is, that you've revealed to us uh, your future that you have for us. Uh, you've revealed to us that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one which was and is and is to come. He's the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's the one that made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him, Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Lord, we rejoice and we praise that one who will come one day in the clouds of glory. That one who is Alpha and Omega. Lord, we pray that he would be lifted up, he would be exalted in our lives. That our testimony, the, the lampstand of our lives and the, the lampstand of our church, Lord God, would burn brightly and shine brightly for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in his mighty and powerful name. Amen.